Thank you very much for that um, incredible introduction, Margaret. Not entirely sure I'm going to follow that. But um, thank you to Margaret and Robin and UPF for um, giving me the possibility to speak. Um, and thank you guys for listening. Um, I hope it will be uh, somewhat useful. So um, as Margaret mentioned, my name is Matteo and I run an organization called Shout Out UK. We're a youth network that tries to get more young people engaged and involved in politics by primarily running political literacy courses and media literacy courses in secondary schools and colleges. So this is about understanding how our system works, understanding what our councillors, what our MPs, how does a bill become a law, the sort of bare bone basics that frankly should already be on the curriculum. Uh, but for one reason that isn't, as well as something called the media literacy, which is how to critically analyze uh, information, understanding what disinformation is, misinformation, and understanding that a fact that you disagree with is not fake news, it's a fact that you simply disagree with. Um, something that someone should probably tell the current <laughs> resident at the White House. But one thing that I wanted to chat um, about today is the element of trust. And um, as you can probably imagine, one of the two types of leaders up there has a bit of a trust issue. I'm going to let you guys guess which one. But trust is a massively important thing. Um, and one of the biggest issues I find when going into schools, and we've gone into just over 700 across the UK, teaching political literacy and engaging women in politics. And one of the biggest recurring issues we come across is the complete lack of trust in politicians in our politics between generations. There's very little trust between young and old and vice versa. There's very little trust between young people and the police. There is very little trust between political um, opposing ideals. Let's not even mention the B word because I don't want to ruin your day. Um, but there's a massive lack of trust within our society at the moment. And I feel like, you know, talking about peace building, without trust there can be no peace. Because, and I'll challenge you guys to sort of think back throughout your life. If you actively don't trust that person, you're not going to turn around and be like, oh, here, and you hold my wallet for a day. If you actively don't trust that person, you're not going to listen to them or take their advice or heed what they're saying. You're going to always question it. That's going to breed resentment. And for me, one of the things that I find most interesting is that that's one of the biggest, most divisive things that's currently happening, I'd say, in the UK, but you can probably take this model across the world. A massive breakdown of trust within different groupings in society that tend not to talk to each other is a massive, massive barrier to peace. And building that trust is so hugely important. And one of the ways that we found that works really well is getting people together in a room, doing activities, hackathons, and engaging with them from different demographics, from different places in life, from different faiths, different creeds, whatever. And this is one of the reasons why I absolutely love UPF's mission, because it's the idea of bringing people that normally maybe not wouldn't talk to each other but bringing them together for the spirit of building trust and building communication. Uh, we did an event, um, which may sound a bit strange, but bear with me. In July, we brought a load of young people together with politicians at Brunel University to play ping pong. It was a sporting competition between politicians, and then we had workshops and a debate and so forth. And what was incredible was that they started to break down those barriers because of that lack of trust and started talking to each other as if they're human beings. And in fact, one young person didn't realize that politicians were actually human beings because they don't seem like it on the media. And that, for me, was really quite interesting because the media and the internet, online social media, has corroded that trust even further. Because if you strip away their job titles, politicians are human beings at the end of the day. And if you consistently pick up newspapers, see on Twitter, another young person stabbed another young person, another young person's done that, another young person's done this, and the media obviously always prioritizes specific skin color because they're apparently the only people that are doing any of this, when in reality that's not true, you as a human being are going to want to start legislating and reacting in a certain way. In the same way as you're a police officer and you constantly see it in TV and you hear it from family and friends, you're going to start reacting that same way in your job. And then on the flip side, when young people, when they see online or when they ever have an interaction with the police, it's always negative or something like that, they're going to start building an element of distrust and dislike of that specific demographic without ever actually having a conversation with those other people, with that kind of industry. And breaking down those barriers and having that event where we brought people together from different, essentially, walks of life was massively powerful, not just for the young people, but also for politicians to realize, hey, we're legislating on the wrong things. Like we're talking about the, the wrong issues. Like we need to listen to these people. Yes. And you think it's a no-brainer, but some people need to be told that actually you do need to listen to the next generation, surprisingly enough. And 
what really cemented it for me was this coming general election on the 12th of December. Because what we're seeing is now, rather than going towards an element of trust and trying to connect and collaborate with each other, regardless of what age, demographic, ethnicity, or whatever you come from, we're actually entrenching ourselves even further. So you look at, for example, the way politicians are now, the way political parties, the garbage they're putting out at the moment is so inflammatory. Every single political party is guilty of it. And you see them put out fake statistics, misinformed facts, because they are essentially appealing to the lowest common denominator. They're appealing to people's fears. They're appealing to people's dislikes of another group that they've never met. They're appealing to fears that are just, there's no basis of reality in those fears. But they know that emotions up are more important than fact. I remember hearing one academic once say that we're living in a post-factual society where facts don't really matter. It's not about what's real, it's about what may, someone makes you believe is real. And that for me is so ridiculously true. It was true in 2016, it is true now. And the way we move forward from that, and I think all of us are responsible, but the way we move forward from that is making sure that we communicate with different groups that we don't normally communicate with. We as an organization, we try and strive to make sure that young people communicate with older people. Because one of the biggest issues now is there is a complete generational disconnect. You've got the, essentially, for lack of a better term, baby boomer generation that constantly hear about you know, young people being soft or young people being, uh, what's the word, snowflakes and all this kind of rubbish. And saying, oh, we've well, never had it so easy because you've got a phone. And young people, on the other hand, saying, well, you've never had it so easy because you could buy a house for nine grand. Whereas now I can buy a, well, I can't even buy a cardboard box for that amount of money. But it's different generations have different problems and different privileges from when they were born and when they were around. It's not a problem, but that communication is not there. And the only information we constantly get is from the media. And frankly, the media have a hell of a lot to answer for because they stoke that fear. And as soon as you remove the media from those conversations, like we did when we brought politicians <laughs> and young people together, suddenly we're talking like human beings. Because the media will only ever talk about a politician when he's, I don't know, fiddling expenses, or when he gets caught with two prostitutes and some cocaine in a hotel, for example. Which, don't get me wrong, they should be exposed for those kind of issues. But when you're consistently fed that kind of negative narrative, is it really that shocking that young people don't engage with politics? Is it really that shocking that our voting turnout is about 60%? And up until, what was it, the youth quake in 20, I think it was 2017, youth turnout in politics was about 30%. And since the youth quake has gone up to 50%, we've got a massive crisis within our democracy where we have completely destroyed and eroded the trust of an entire generation in our political structure. And that is how, sorry, healing that is how you start to build trust. And how you build trust is how you start to build peace. Because without trust, without communication, without intergenerational dialogue, without dialogue between, between different political parties, different ideals, you're never going to have peace. And that's why the organizations, political parties, and all these kind of different groups, pressure groups, and all that kind of need to come together and be like, hold on, let's have an actual conversation. Let's not consistently focus on the negative. Let's not go down to the lowest common denominator and focus on emotions and feelings and focus on you know, things that will trigger someone just because they don't like a certain group for whatever reason. Let's try and bring people together from different groups because actually we've got a lot more in common than we actually think we do. And that, building that peace, sorry, building that trust and building that bridge of communication thing is imperative and the first step to building peace. And for me, one of the biggest steps to building trust within, not specifically our political system at the moment, because I think it's got a lot of issues, but building trust in that we are in a country, we are in a place where you can change society for the better if you want to, because we have a lot of freedoms in this country. That starts with education. And that's what, for me, political literacy is the answer to a lot of things. Because you bring political literacy into schools, you empower people to have a voice have a say on how society works. You teach them how to engage with it. You teach them how to become elected if they want to. You teach them how to vote, how to have a voice, how to campaign. You suddenly empower people to change society for the better, rather than this feeling of complete helplessness and hatred towards the system we live under. Thank you very much. Thank you.